This is a production of Cornell University. In a Word is a series that was begun and, and is sponsored by the Creative Writing Program. And it's just simply to share with you uh, our wonderful faculty. You know, most of us, if not all of us, travel all over the world. I mean, we're, uh, you know, we do presentations in, in Europe, uh, in China, uh, India. Uh, South America, and, uh, and of course all over the U.S., but we rarely do presentations here. You know, we rarely do presentations here. And so, uh, so you know, we decided, well, no, I want to, you know, let's, let's share, let's share. So I'd like to introduce to, uh, Ernesto Quinones. He's a native and a former resident of East Harlem, and he is the author of the best-selling novel, Bodega Dreams and Chango's Fire. Uh, Bodega Dreams was chosen as a Barnes and Noble Discover Great New uh, Writers. And border, he's the Border Original Voices, the New York Public Library's 25 Books to Remember, as well as the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times Notable Books of the Year. In 2003, he was chosen as a visiting screenwriter by the Sundance Screenwriters Lab in Sundance, uh, uh, Utah. Um, his influences are everywhere. I mean, he's, he's, um, he's it's a mestizaje, uh, a natural organic progression of self-expression, raising from the very, very uh, um, pavements of our cities. Uh, we've seen, we've seen he, he, he likes writers like uh, Richard Wright or Henry Roth. He's, uh, as a Latino writer, his literary roots run deep and wide from Camus to Marquez, from Carrillo to Fitzgerald, and his love of literature remains as powerful as his work. And, uh, and just to give you a little note about why I love Ernesto, um, I was yes, trying to, I was trying to, I was trying to, to have a creative writing uh, meeting, and so it was like herding cats. And so I put like herding cats because it's so difficult to get all of us together under one roof. So uh, Ernesto, Ernesto turns around and he says, "I understand your frustration in getting everyone together. No problem. I can make September." second meeting at any time. Also, I think cats are cool. They move like Jim Morrison and act like James Dean. They are true existentialists. Now dogs, dogs happily accept anything that, that is fed to them like, like good Christians. So I'd rather be a cat. Everybody has this opinion. Thanks, Elena. So don't send emails, you erase them. Um, let me just begin by saying, a quick summary, and this summary is basically um, a story, and this story is told by the neighbor, okay? And it's about a reclusive man who lives in a mansion, and this man seems to be a gentleman, but his manners are not quite there. You can say that they're kind of uncouth, as if he is hiding something, as if he doesn't really come from what he claims he comes from, which is old money. We later learn that this man had once been in love with a rich and spoiled and bratish temper-throwing woman who actually had been in love with him but did not marry him because he had a low social status and also a very low education. She in turn has married a wealthy man or has married into more wealth as she was not poor to begin with. This man now has disappeared and when he reappears back in the story, where the story actually begins, he is actually wealthy, he is actually full of riches, and his only goal is to take back the love, to recapture that love of that woman who had scorned him, who had left him, and married into more money because he didn't have any. The name of this novel, which I'm sure you all know by now, is called Withering Heights by Emily Bronte. You know, it is interesting, I'm sorry there's typos. It is interesting to know that um, in both novels, novels, uh, they start at the lawn. They start pretty much at the lawn where these two mysterious characters live. Bronte's Mr. Lockwood and Heathcliff could easily be mistaken for Nick Garraway and Gatsby. Both these reclusive and desolate men become close friends, just as Mr. Lockwood calls Heathcliff a capital fellow, and later he says that his heart warmed to his jealous eyes is very much 
akin to Garraway stating that there was something gorgeous about Gatsby, that he had that heightened sensitivity that, like those machines that are connected to, that can register earthquakes from miles away. In both novels, Mr. Lockwood and Nick Garraway are pathetic, peripheral, passive narrators that don't do nothing, don't do much at all. They're not really involved in the story. They're basically there to tell you the story and are basically outsiders looking in. To intertextually compare The Great Gatsby and Withering Heights is cheap and easy, and I will spare you that. I basically use this to have some sort of familiarity. Um, these stories are basically archetypes, uh, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl again, they die, they become ghosts, or one of them dies, the other one doesn't die, but they're basically blueprints. But it was basically to start my point on influence. And that is basically that characters, plots, scenes, themes, stories themselves were made to be stolen. We have been ripping off the Greeks and other culture smiths for centuries. Fitzgerald himself admits to have stolen spare parts. He called them spare parts of Tramilchio, which is a character from a first century work called the Satyricon by a first century Roman author named Petronius. What exactly is the quintessential novel of the past century but a brilliant retelling of a Homeric myth? And what exactly is the quintessential epic poem of the past century but a brilliant pastiche of fragments shorn against the poet's ruins. Originality isn't just overrated, doesn't really exist. We as writers, what we do is basically bring our own fingerprints to our work. These fingerprints include our own philosophies, ethnicities, background, gender, personal politics, your upbringing. But in all, all this acts, acts, is, um, acts is a mask to basically cover, cover up stories that have been told and retold and told again in the pawn shops of storytelling. The two stories I am here to discuss today are not your typical archetypes. In fact, the second one is very strange. But if we power up our microscopes, we can find where they actually come from. But that is another talk. I am basically saying that these are the same stories, the first one and how the second one could have possibly have borrowed from the first. No typos, good, I think. OK, this sentence here was told by the prosecutioner to the jury about this young man who actually didn't do much. He was pretty much a loafer. He had a job, but it was basically he wanted that job so he can have some money so he can play. His relationships with women were basically meaningless. He only wanted them for one thing, and then he loved instant gratification, and he would leave them or not care about them. He was very alienated to his mother, and in the end, it's really what also doomed him. This sentence is from Richard Wright's native son. Native Son by Richard Wright, published in 1940, was the first African-American novel to be named Best Selection by the Book of the Month Club. It was also the best-selling work by a black writer, selling over 200,000 copies first month of publication. Those are envious, envious uh, sales, even in today's standards, with no internet, no chain stores, and Richard Wright actually sold 200,000 copies in the first month. This was a big book, a book that anyone who will call themselves literate in the bookish sense, or in the academic sense, could not have ignored. It was that much of a big book. The protagonist is Bigger Thomas, who is neither class conscious nor indeed conscious of much of anything. Pleasure and pursuits and some happiness are always on his mind. He is dirt poor, lives with his mother and siblings in a Chicago ghetto, 
Soon he takes a job as a chauffeur for a rich family, the Daltons, whose daughter Mary is really only out for kicks. She likes to drink a lot. She likes to hang out with communists. And one night she gets too drunk, so drunk that Bigger doesn't only drive her home, but he has to take her from the limo to her bedroom. By coincidence, Mary's mother walks into the bedroom and Bigger knows what this will imply. And so he places a pillow on Mary's face to keep her quiet, her mumbling, drunken, and accidentally kills her. The irony, of course, is that Mary's mother was blind. Bigger flees, he is caught, and this is followed by a colossal trial where his mother is hugely invoked and used as evidence towards his demise and eventually his death sentence. Now this line is from the novel that's pretty much a rewriting of Native Son. In Albert Camus' The Stranger, the protagonist is a white Algerian named Marcel, a man who isn't class conscious or much conscious of much of anything, pleasure and happiness and instant gratification, meaningless relationships with women, and loafing is pretty much what he cares about. He has a job, but pretty much so he can play, so he can have money to play. He takes very few responsibilities, and soon he commits a senseless murder. He kills an Arab at a beach because of the heat. A huge trial commences where he is found guilty because he did not cry at his mother's funeral and is sentenced to death. Both novels have almost identical scenes. I will only point out one, such as when both the protagonists are visited in their cells by a holy man. In both scenes, you have a slow buildup of disgust and rejection towards the holy man. For Bigger, it is the pastor. For Marisol, it is the Jesuit. In both cases, Bigger and Marisol don't speak. They both become these very meek and weak characters until they can no longer tolerate the holy man and they burst out in these fits of anger and they both throw the holy man out of their cells. It's the same scene where if we read it, we will see very similar existentialist themes on right and wrong, on happiness, are being displayed in a back and forth verbal tennis match between priest and, or Jesuit, I'm sorry, pastor, priest, and um, Marcel and Bigger. But I will spare you from this too the intertextual comparisons are fun, but they're cheap and easy. We are after something larger. And that is, I think, that Camus could have possibly, might have read Native Son and found something there, something that he could use for his own novel. All he needed was to bring his own fingerprints to it. And maybe, Maybe he found that missing element for the stranger, or that missing element was clarified when he examined a senseless death, a senseless murder in an American inner colonialized ghetto of Chicago's America of Native Son. If we look at the racial climate from Camus side, 1940s colonialized Algeria, a white French Algerian was considered a first-class citizen. The Arabs, who had been living there for centuries, the native sons, were considered your second-class citizens. Now, if we bring in Camus' statement, belief, philosophy, theory, whatever you want to call it, of the absurd, which is defined in this by the World Encyclopedia, the efforts of humanity to find meaning or rational explanation in the universe ultimately fail, Hence, are absurd, don't try it, it doesn't exist, because no such meaning exists, at least to human beings. The world is absurd, the reality is the absurdity. They're basically the same thing. Reality and the absurd are not two different sides of the same coin, they are the coin. It's the same exact thing. Or you can say it's the same side to the same coin. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Now, Let's throw in a senseless murder. Okay, and let's keep in the Algeria at the time. This is the reality of Camus' 
1940s Algeria. And of course, this makes no sense. There's no justice here. This is illogical. This should not happen should the universe care for us. But of course, it's a meaningless universe. It's a universe that is indifferent. It is a universe that does not care. And therefore, the absurd and the reality are basically the same thing. OK, let's turn the coin the other side. And you basically have the same thing. 1940s Algeria, this, if the universe was, was full of justice, this is what we would get. Unfortunately, it is not. So this is also absurd. This is also illogical. This is also not there. So therefore, the absurd and the reality are the same exact things in Camus' existentialist thought, in Camus' Algeria. Now, before this was sort of examined in The Stranger, he might have seen this in Native Son. Let's just switch some stuff around. What would happen in a Chicago ghetto should a white man kill a black man? This is illogical. Yet it was the reality. This is absurd if the universe had feelings, if the universe cared, if the universe was not indifferent. But it is a meaningless existence. It is all illogical. Therefore, the absurd and the reality are the same exact thing. If we turn the coin around, it's also absurd. This would never happen. It would happen if the universe had meaning, if the universe was logical. It is not. This is not a logical situation. This is what we get at the beginning, I'm sorry, at, in Native Sun. Camus could have possibly seen this and said, huh, I see something that is happening here. Let me bring in my fingerprints. To reinforce our point, notice how Jimmy saw it. No matter how well he was treated in Paris, no matter how warmly he was accepted by the literati and other people, he knew what was going on around him. And Camus was no dummy as, as well. He knew that there was these similarities mm -hmm. that were happening in, his, in France as well as back home. There are, because there are so many kernels of existentialist passages all over Native Son, Camus could have read Native Son and seen how he could word all this differently, give it his own fingerprints, bring in his Algerian soil and upbringing and his philosophies and clarified whatever is it that basically say the same thing that Richard Wright was saying only in his own words, using his own fingerprints. OK, I will say this, though. There is no evidence that Camus had read Native Son. Any documented evidence in any of the biographies that I read, I never found it. In any of the research I've done, I never found it. Even when I was in school and I loved Camus, I did not find it. And I looked for it, never find it, never found it. The novels were also published very close to each other, Native Son in 1940 and Camus' The Stranger in 1942. Doesn't give you a lot of time to read, process, write a first draft, second draft, steal this, steal that. You have to give it to Guillemar. Guillemar's gonna publish it in a year. There's really not enough time. But, but, there is a window here. There is a window of possibility. Here it is. Camus freely admits to have written a first draft of The Stranger in 1936. Let's keep that in mind. That first draft's gonna come back. He said that he will carry it around, mess, it, mess around with it, but he never gave it to Guillemar to publish it. Camus freely admits that during that time, he had been reading American authors. He mentions Dos Passos, he mentions Faulkner, he mentions James Cain, who wrote uh, The Postman Always Rings Twice. 
he freely admits to have borrowed. There's the fingerprints again. There is your stealing. Hemingway's minimalism to write the stranger. His minimalist prose, Hemingway, um, Camus loved Hemingway's minimalist prose. He actually said, I would trade 100 French writers for one Hemingway. So he read them. He knew how to read English. He learned in secondary school. He learned how to read English and Latin. No talk of right. Remember that first draft of 1936? Well, time passed. Camus died. He was uh, with, his, with his editor, Guillemar. Guillemar actually killed his writer. A lot of editors want to kill their writers. This one did. Guillemar was driving, and they crashed, and he killed Camus. Um, which is wonderful for Camus, in a way. It's the perfect death. But anyway, his editor killed him. Time passed. In 1970, that first draft was published in 1970, and it was called A Happy Death. In that first draft of The Stranger, written in 1936, where the forward says that he stopped messing around with that draft in 1938 and started to sort of rework it really well, after 1938, they published the draft, the first first draft from 36 to 38. In that first draft, there is no murder. There is no mother. There is no trial. The three major elements that you will find in Native Son are all there. What Camus could have possibly seen in Native Son was a senseless murder where he could bring his own fingerprints, his own native Algeria, his own philosophy of the absurd. He basically took the murder, took the mother, took the trial, and added his fingerprints. Let's quickly review both novels. Each is focused on a semi-conscious murder. In each case, the protagonist, Bigger and Mersol, wander in a dream world of immediate, irresponsible experiences, instant gratification, and sensations. Both Bigger and Mersol are fatherless from a young age. Both are involved in romantic relationships to which they attend no significance to. The women do, but they don't care. Both are deeply alienated from their mothers, both love to go to the movies and hang out with not so very nice people. Marisol with the pimp Raymond, bigger with his friends who are thieves and were planning a heist. Um, both bigger and um, both lead a combination of accidents leads them both to carry out a killing. After that, the significance of earlier incidents come into play during the trial where the mother is heavily involved in the prosecution's case for both sons being insensitive and cold and finally incriminating them. Both violently reject Christian religious representatives who visit them in their cells. In both scenes, there is a slow building climax. The settings of both novels are in colonized situations, the internal colony of Chicago to black ghetto of Chicago to French run Algeria. Racial fear and misunderstanding are factors in both murder situations. Camus underplays it really well. He basically takes it for granted that the, that his, um, that the French and the Algerians would know exactly the climate that they're reading about and would see it. He did not insult the audience. Right on the other hand, made it completely clear. And I think that this is one, one of the reasons why later in the 1950s, Camus actually denounced the American novel, the novel that he supposedly had loved so much that he was willing to trade 100 French writers for one Hemingway, he denounced the American novel in the 50s for what he called its crude realism. I don't know. I think if you're talking crude realism, you're not talking so much Hemingway, so much Kane, so much Faulkner, so much Dos Passos as you are talking Richard Wright. Neither Wright's Bigger nor Camus Marceau are really written as positive role models. Rather, they are individuals whose condition and fate illustrate a pitiless, natural world. They're pretty much tragic figures where the absurd is reality. Best thing is not to fight it, to go with it, to embrace it. In both novels, after a struggle between lawyers for the defense and lawyers for the prosecution, both novels climax in the imprisonment of the protagonist, and both protagonists have these epiphanies in their cells. Both make no excuses for what they have done 
and in both novels they end with the impending execution during which each time there's enigmatic remarks about their faith as each embraces the absurd. Notice the subtle poetry of Camus' fingerprints, the lyricism in Mersault's embrace of the absurd. Earlier we had that famous line where I open myself to the indifference of the world, to the gentle indifference of the world. Compared to the wonderful and but crude prose, still wonderful of Richard Wright. But both are saying the same thing. It is the same dialogue, it is the same sentiment, possibly the same book. If we change the point of view and then we crunch it, crunch these two sentences into one paragraph, we basically have, it flows really well as if it was written by the same author. He still held on to the bars, then he smiled a faint, wry, bitter smile. He had only wished that there be a large crowd of spectators the day of his execution and that they greet him with cries of hate. Turn it around. I still held on to the bars, then I smiled a faint, wry, bitter smile. I had only wished. Basically, it works both ways. Basically, it works as one paragraph. The only thing that can separate it, or possibly could separate it, is the fingerprints. There is a story I heard at City College, and it was basically told to me by my professors, and it was that when William Burroughs would um, enter the classroom first day of class, he would walk in slowly, and they said that he was always growling, that he was like some puppy, you know, and that he wouldn't say anything, and the students, of course, are in fear and in awe. This is William S. Burroughs, author of Naked Lunch, this guy killed his wife playing William Tell, had an apple in her head, shot her by mistake, got away with it. This is the guy hanging out with Kerouac and Cassidy, the guy who told Lucian and Kerouac to go have fun and turn themselves in when Lucian had killed Kramer. This is William Burroughs. So they were, they, just, they were just waiting to see what he was going to do, what was he going to say. And that he would sit down and he would slowly take off his blazer and that the first words he would utter were in that wheezing, sneezing, William Burroughs way of his, was, steal everything. <laughs> that story is true. I agree with it. Steal everything. The talent lies in your fingerprints. How to hide them. It's okay. Scholars will find you out. But remember, we don't write for scholars. We write for readers. Readers don't care. Readers want a good story. I hope this works. I would like to leave you with um, two film clips. And let's call the first one the original, even though there is no such thing. If we look at the first one, we can see influence of 18th century Protestant painting. We can see Stringbird, Ring Kierkegaard. But let's call it the first one. And then we'll see the second one. And we'll see all of a lot of similarities, as well as differences. We'll only talk about one, and for not very long. Anyway, let's run it. Someone want to get the lights? Hopefully it's working. Okay. Karin och Maria är här för att hälsa på mig. Det 
är underbart att få vara tillsammans igen som i gamla dagar. Jag känner mig också mycket friskare. Vi kan till och med göra en liten promenad tillsammans. Det blir en så stor upplevelse. Men särskilt för mig som inte varit utomhus på ganska länge. Plötsligt började vi skrattande springa mot den gamla gungan som vi inte besökt som barndomen. Vi satt oss i den som tre små snälla systrar. Och Anna gungade oss långsamt och vaken. All verk var borta. Det människor jag håller mest av i världen var hos mig. Jag kunde höra dem småprata runt omkring mig. Jag kände närvaron av deras kroppar. Värmen av deras händer. Jag ville hålla fast ögonblicket och tänkte. Det här är ju att vara lycka. Jag kan inte önska någonting bättre. Nu. Några minuter får jag uppleva fullständighet. Och jag känner en stor tacksamhet mot mitt liv. Som ger mig så mycket. After the funeral service, we all returned to the beach house. I couldn't help experiencing some very nostalgic memories. Naturally of my mother. And pleasantly of the few warmer moments we'd known. I recalled how beautiful she was, dressing to go out for the evening with my father. And of how Renata looked up to her and her ideas about art. And how Flynn was so impressed as a tiny girl when Mother decorated a Christmas tree. I felt compelled to write these thoughts down. They seemed very powerful to me. Let's get the light. You know, there's this, um, coming back to existentialism and French uh, philosophers, there's this French philosopher named Pascal Brunner, spelled Bruckner, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. If he was here, he would correct me, I'm sure. Um, he's contemporary, he's still alive. And uh, he wrote a book called Perpetual Euphoria. And he talks about happiness and how Americans should listen to their constitution, which says that it is a pursuit. It isn't something that you can actually own isn't something that you can actually really always have and yet uh, Americans have this thing about always being happy with it through meds or therapy or plastic surgery or whatever you call it and he quotes Sartre here and he says that they become comedians of their own lives that they're living in bad faith and he says that what life gives us is uh, these what he likes to call moments of grace and these moments of grace do happen and the thing is that if you are lucky enough or if you are fortunate enough to be at the intercepting point of the moment of grace and the awareness in that moment in that second however long it lasts you have found eternity eternity is in life you have found perfection and you know that this moment will not come back however long it lasts 
and that is truly, truly happiness. If we use that as our guide, notice that in the first clip in the Bergman film, Harriet Anderson, the sister, she was experiencing a moment of grace. She knew that this moment will never come back. She was truly happy. She knew someday, sooner or later, she was very sick in the movie, so she was going to die soon. But she was going to die, and yet she was very happy. At that instant, she was lucky enough to actually be at the intercepting point between the awareness and the moment of grace. In the Woody Allen clip played by uh, Mary Beth Hurt, that character was recalling moments of grace, which isn't as cool, isn't as effective, but she was recalling moments of grace. She was not um, there at the intercepting points from the awareness and uh, when the moments of grace was happening. Pascal says that the uh, thing is that these uh, intercepting points these of the awareness and the moment, you cannot force them. This is very different than taking time to smell the roses. That is completely different. This is completely universal luck, and there's nothing you can do. You cannot force them, and that bites. Okay, well, as Mr. Harrison said, all good things must pass. Well, all things must pass. And I'll, I'll take some questions, and then we can go. Well, what is your definition of originality? My original originality is how much it excites me, you know? My, um, if I see something that is told differently, completely differently, or from a point of view that I have yet to experience, and that is why we need more stories from other cultures that don't necessarily get their spotlight, because they actually are being told from a point of view that we do not know. I do not know who the Aboriginal Joyce is. I'm sure he or she are awesome, but who is the Aboriginal? Who is the Quechua T.S. Eliot? I have no idea who the Quechua T.S. Eliot, who is the Bushman that writes like Hemingway or the Hemingway of the Bushman. I don't know. These are they're going to be similar stories, but these are going to bring something really original to me. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the wonderful thing about one of my students in my class, she's writing this uh, kooky, crazy, but wonderful sci-fi about a demon who comes to from, from hell here on earth to save someone. Of course, we heard that story. But she said, in her story, she says something very interesting. The demon says, humans are so boring. They're really all alike. Two arms, two legs, one nose, one mouth, two eyes. I'm like, yeah. You have to really get to know them. You really have to explore their fingerprints. And that's when they become interesting. Mm -hmm. That's when you find the originality, I think. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you that it's like there's a limited number of stories that keep getting retold over and over. And you, know, you can find, and your emphasis was on plots. I'm wondering though, what you think about kinds of writing, whether fiction or nonfiction, that at least claim to be sort of directly based on experience, on fact, memoir, or even something like you know, an autobiographical novel like Proust's or other people's. Like, do you still see in those that element of stealing, you know, elements of past narratives, or is it? Is that a way to sort of short circuit the process and plug into something other than previous writer's work? You know, the first, the first job as a writer, you're basically an entertainer. No matter how philosophical or how intelligent you think you are, you're basically entertaining people. You're basically hoping that they turn the page. I don't, I don't consider myself a academic detective. That is for the scholars. Should I read Proust and want to do a thesis on Proust or a big dissertation? I'm sure I can find something there. Proust comes from somewhere. I am not, I, am, I try to read Proust to be totally honest and I remember at page 30, I told my professor I am still at breakfast and he said, oh, wait till you get to the cookies. I was like, oh my God, you know? So I, Proust doesn't really move me, but it's cool. I'm sure that if he did, I would see where he comes from and that is the job of the academics. I think academics are wonderful. I think they see things the way that writers don't. And I think that um, we don't write for academics. Remember, we write for readers. But I do when I, I'm just a guppy surrounded in this shark infested waters of sharks in this literature um, thing. But when they do do a story, when they do write about me, I, I'm very grateful. And I see where they get these kernels of my origins. And at the same time, I think that, um, they say outrageous things, 
For example, Helena was there at that one of the conferences. We were in New York City, remember, yeah, Janjay? Right, yes. And some, someone was doing a talk on me, and I sat all the way at the back, and I'm listening. And she was talking about a short story I wrote, and there's a line there that says, the days are filled with air. And she turned it into this big, oppressive how light of hope in a Spanish Harlem where there's all this oppression. And I thought that she did a wonderful job. I thought this professor's brilliant. Of course, if she would ask me, I would say, Scarlett said that at two, <laughs> we're having breakfast, and she put her hand through the donut and said, Dad, the days are filled with air. And I said, wow, I got a poet. <laughs> that's the real. But you know, if a scholar wants to see that, I think that's absolutely wonderful. And that also, the good scholarship, the good academic papers are not there to, for the academic to create their niche, but sort of have some sort of to, elong to, to, make, to branch off, to, to give another branch to that work, mm -hmm. to see it from a completely different angle, completely point of view where even the writer says, wow, I did not think of that. And if the writer is not arrogant, we say, actually, that is absolutely beautiful. It is really not my work anymore. Once it's out to the universe, once I publish it, it belongs to whoever wants to buy it. And they have the right to hate it, not like it, like it, or actually study it, examine it, and write whatever it is that they want to. So there's, um, I think it's like, I think it's like he's a painter, and he talks about how originality is not a real thing, and he gets so tired about tired of people talking about originality. And he says that he thinks the the job of the artist is to figure out who his actual ancestor is, artistic ancestor is, and perfect what that artist does or do the work that that artist has left undone, which seems like very similar to what you're talking about. But you seem to be talking more about like narratives, like the actual stories rather than specific authors. I just wondering if you could comment on. Like the verse between the story itself versus what authors individually are doing in a kind of ancestry. Um, I'm sorry, Corey. What I I can you frame that again? Sure. So the artist doesn't believe in originality, which is okay. Great. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. And you want me to talk about the difference between the story mm -hmm. and the between the story is like an abstract entity versus an artist or a writer having very particular writers that they're in conversation with? You know, I think that the writer basically takes whatever sings to him or her. And I also think that whether it's abstract or concrete, regardless of what it is uh, that uh, you're reading or whatever it is, you, we are being attacked by different forms of storytelling every day in our lives, not just the internet. All of that, and this is Jungian, it comes into the collective conscious of, of humanity. So therefore, even if it's an abstract work, or even if it's you know, something that we can exactly grasp, let's say, you are being influenced anyway by everything around you. So to say that you come out of nothing is absolutely impossible. We are always being influenced. Even if you don't read, you're being influenced by either television, your movies, your friends, your you were coming from somewhere. Um, so um, I don't think that there's such a thing as originality. I will tell you this, though. When I, sometimes they ask me what made you want to rewrite Gatsby. And I think one of my f earliest memories of doing something like that was actually in art school, You're talking about a, a painter. And I remember sitting in this class, and it was a very boring professor. We all hated him. This guy was boring. He, he could ruin a wet dream. This guy was terrible. <laughs> Um, and I remember being so bored at the, in the dark, and I looked to the other side, and there was two girls kissing, which was nice. And, um, <laughs> and then I looked back, and it was Mar Marcel Duchamp's Mona Lisa with the, with the mustache. And it was the first time I had heard of him, and it was the first time I had seen it. And I remember the first thing that came to my mind is this guy has guts. He's not going after Tintoretto. He's not even going after, this guy's going after Da Vinci. I'm like, this is heavy, man. This guy is like, no joke. This is guy is asking LeBron James to play, not just anybody in the Emmy. He's like, I'll take you on. Come on, come on, come on, mother effer. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And I think that when I decided if I'm going to make fun or whatever it is that I began, I said, what exactly is the quintessential American novel? You know, I thought Grace of Wrath, which I think Helena did read. You did read that when you wrote the Under the Feet of Jesus. And scholars have found you, which is great. And they write these wonderful papers comparing both novels. Okay? And I said, which one is Grace of Wrath? This one, I think, I think Gatsby is the So I think it comes from that, uh, that day being bored in, uh, in art school. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming. Have a, have a good time. I'll see you.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.